Coming up, it's a high-res audio player, a brand new venue from Dell, a first look at an Acer convertible tablet, Raspberry Pi 2, a smartphone for people who hate big screens. That's right, we're mixing it up. That's why you got to watch before you buy. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Before You Buy is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Before You Buy is brought to you by SmartThings. SmartThings lets you monitor, control, and automate your home from wherever you are using your smartphone. Right now, SmartThings is offering Before You Buy listeners 10% off any home security or solutions kit, and you get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. Welcome to Before You Buy. It's the Twitch show where we give the latest gadgets and gizmos to the Twitch staff to see what they really think about the latest and greatest out of the consumer world. I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit. Now, uh, you may notice that I'm not Leo Laporte. Well, that's because we asked Leo to take it easy. He's been hosting this show for the better part of three years, and uh, we wanted him to relax. So we gave him this. This is a high-res, all-aluminum audio player. We said... Leo, take some time, exercise, and just enjoy yourself. So let's take a look at the file. Oh, hi. <laughs> Let me turn this off here. Hold on a second. I'm working out. Ah, and you know, when you're working out, you want to listen to some tunes. I'm not listening to my iPhone, though. I'm not listening to my iPod, either. I'm not even listening to my fancy Dan Neil Young Pono player. I'm listening to something brand new. My review today is of this. Let me take the headphones out and show you my new FIO X1. It's in the silicone case. I do that to keep it from getting wet. And it's sealed all around, which is kind of nice. Just exposure to the click wheel and the screen. Inside, a really pretty aluminum, solid aluminum uh, case. This is a high-res music player, so it can play back any kind of digital file I have, not just AAC and MP3s, uh, but it'll even play back FLAC, the lossless compression flack, Apple lossless, and it'll play back bit rates up to 192 kilohertz, 24 bit. I mean, the highest quality high res files. Now, a portable audio player like this uh, wouldn't be any good if it didn't sound good, and they put some pretty good hardware inside of here. Fio chose to use the Texas Instruments uh, 1542 digital to analog converter. It's a new part. Uh, audio files haven't really weighed in on it yet, but uh, it does have 112 dB signal to noise. That's very good, a lot better than an iPhone, for instance. Um, maybe not as good as some of the higher end audio file DACs, but this is a high quality DAC with a nice sound. Also, a very good headphone amplifier in here that's able to power uh, even uh, high quality headphones. I've been using my Etymotic ER4s, these are excellent in ear monitors, but it'll even power my high impedance headphones like my magnetic planar. Uh, high Feynman headphones, which, which take a lot of juice. I think they're 35 ohm uh, headphones. That's a high impedance. And there's enough juice here to listen at, at normal, even somewhat loud listening volumes. The controls are good. This has uh, not a touch screen, but uh, a nice color screen that has a fairly useful interface. Lots of good stuff too. Gapless playback. That's something Neil's Pono player doesn't do. Uh, it also has a seven channel equalizer with presets. Um, and boy, look at all the buttons on the front of this. Not only is there an on off button, but volume up and down, uh, previous channel, next track, back and uh, settings button. And the scroll wheel, unlike the iPod, actually scrolls. You can even hit the, the big fat click wheel. So in some ways there's a, actually a duplication of functionality, but that's fine. I find it very easy to use, very easy to find what I want. Uh, the screen displays album art in color. Also, bit rate information. Uh, I, I think this is well made. This is a, you know, kind of a post iPod uh, portable audio player. I saved the best for last. The FIO X1 is $100. $100.
dollars. Now that doesn't include storage. And in a way, I kind of like this idea. It uses micro SD cards and you supply your own SD cards up to 128 gigabytes. So I bought a, a SanDisk 128 gig um, micro SD card for hundred bucks. So $200 total for storage uh, and the Fio X1. Nice though, you can have multiple uh, SD cards, one for your workout, one for chilling, uh, you know, and that's, that's kind of cool. Certainly enough to store as big a music library as you'd want. Um, $100 for this. So let me give you the pros and the cons. But for that, I think I need to retire to my relaxation zone. Ah, after a workout, it's so great to relax in the hot tub with your tunes. And uh, the uh, X1 comes along with me thanks to that silicone wrapper. It's not waterproof, but at least it keeps splashes off of it. And notice it's even powerful enough to drive these high impedance Hi-Fi Man HE560 headphones at a reasonable level. That's pretty sweet. Probably shouldn't wear those in the hot tub though. Let's take off the silicone wrapper and give you the pros and cons on the Fios X1. Uh, Pro, well, it stands right out at you. It's beautifully designed. This is aluminum. Uh, the functions are easy to use. We're in the post iPod era. People pretty much understand how one of these is supposed to work. I love the return of the click wheel. It's kind of rubberized, feels great. The big button makes it very easy to use. Um, it doesn't have a hold button, but when you press the on off power switch, uh, if you turn off, you don't see the screen, but also the buttons become inactive. So it doesn't really need a hold switch. Um, it, I like the software. I love the equalizer, the gapless playback, dark side of the moon, baby. Awesome. Uh, and it's great that I can do both uh, line out and uh, headphone out, uh, one jack. The USB, micro USB port means I can charge it with pretty much anything. And that's both charging and data, which is nice. So if you don't have a micro SD card reader, don't, don't worry. You just plug it into your computer, copy your files onto it. 11 hours battery life. And Fio says they're gonna to get to 15 with a firmware update. That's more than enough for me. Uh, on the cons, there's only a, co oh, I left out the most important pro, the price, 100 bucks. On the cons, uh, of course it doesn't include headphones, but for 100 bucks, you have a little extra to buy some high-end headphones. You're not gonna want your Apple earbuds in this. You need some good high fidelity in-ear monitors uh, to really get the most out of it. It also doesn't include any memory, but I think that's great. It gives me the flexibility to buy one or more micro SD cards to fit my needs. And with 128 gigs of storage uh, and the player, I'm still only paying $200. That's half the Pono player. Okay, maybe the Fio X1 doesn't sound as good to those golden ears as the Pono player. I really can't tell. It sounds great to me and it could play back all my files, even the high res ones. It's a definite buy for the Fio X1. So I'm gonna chill out, relax, listen to some tunes and uh, send it back to you, Father Robert. You, 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 you can't tell I'm naked in here, can you? Oh. Huh. Yeah. Okay, so um, now I know why it says naked aluminum on the sheet. That was uh, Leo Laporte with the Fio X1 high-res audio player. Uh, thank you very much for that. A uh, comprehensive review, Leo, and you go on relaxing. Make sure you relax a lot, and next time, work on the crop a little bit. All right, so uh, when we come back, we've got uh, plenty more. We're going to be looking at cell phones for people who are tired of big screens. Now, it's not that simple. I mean, I know there are people who like all different types of phones, and if, if you've gotten tired with the space race to get bigger and bigger screens, and you're tired of looking like you hold a tablet up to your head, you're going to want to check out Merriam's review of the Sony Xperia. It's the latest and greatest from the Gizwizzes over there. But before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about something that I hold near and dear to my heart because I was at CES this year. And at CES, one of the big buzzwords was automation, specifically home automation. How do you make your home smart? Now, there were a lot of solutions at the show, and most of them required you to use your home and your appliances and your things in the way that they wanted you to use. I mean, it's only natural. They, they design it, they create it, they make it, so you use it that way. But you could do it a different way. You could do it the smart things way. A smart things, quite simply, is a way to speak to everything. It doesn't matter what equipment you use. It doesn't matter what you want to automate. It doesn't really matter what you buy because smart things speaks to it all. That's right. It's CNET's highest rated smart home system. It allows you to monitor, control, and automate your home from anywhere using your smartphone. 
Now your lights, your locks, your thermostats, your home security are all connected through a single app. I think about that. It's a single pane of glass to control everything in your house. It has intuitive controls that allow you to set the rules on your smart home through their free iOS, Android, and Windows phone apps. Now, with SmartThings, you can customize the way your smart devices talk to each other. So now you can tap goodnight on your phone and the lights will turn off. The thermostat will adjust and the doors will lock. You could set your lamps to brighten each morning at sunrise or when you want to wake up. You could even keep your home protected with smart things with home security, motion detection, water detection, and more. Now, Brian, go ahead and go to the table here because I want to show you some of the things that smart home can give you for your smart home, smart things. This, this is the hub. This is where it all starts. But all of these sensors around me allow you to customize your smart home the way that you want it to work. For example, I could have this presence sensor on me so that when I walk towards my home, it automatically knows that it should unlock my doors. It should change the thermostat. It should turn on my Sono system. It should look at the drop cam to make sure that no one's lurking in my entryway. These are all the rules that you could work with. Uh, for example, if you want to integrate this with, with with uh, uh, IFT, uh, I call it IFT. Now, it's, it's not just that it works with these modules. It works with the home automation that you already have. And that really is the genius of the smart things, smart home. Again, Smart Things was named CES 2015 Editor's Choice Award. So if you are looking at a home automation system, something for your Internet of Things, this is where you need to go. Now, to get you started setting up your smart home right now, SmartThings is offering before you buy listeners 10% off any home security or solutions kit. And you get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com slash twid and use the offer code twid at check checkout. That's smartthings.com slash twid. And we thank SmartThings for their support before you buy. Now, let's get back to it again. I like big screens, but some people don't like having a laptop in their pocket. That's why we had Miriam Joar take a look at the new Sony Xperia for those people who want something a bit more petite. Hey there, it's Miriam Joar for BYB, and this is the Sony Xperia Z3 Compact. Yes, compact. That's why it looks so small next to my gigantic head. But you know what? Um, there's a lot to be said about flagship devices that are compact, and this is one of the few. Right now, if you want a flagship phone, you can't get anything that's easily you know, smaller than five inches, really. And this is the, one of the few, and probably the only one, that doesn't sacrifice in any way, shape, or form on specs and performance. I really like this phone. This is a really, really good device. So let me walk you through it a little bit. This is a cool orange color. It comes in a bunch of different colors. If you go to Sony's website, be aware, this is sold unlocked in the US through various retailers, including Sony, I believe Amazon as well. And uh, I don't have an exact price point, but it's around $450, which is really quite affordable uh, for a fully fledged device with working LT bands for the US and a very nice version of Android, very little contamination in terms of, you know, uh, manufacturer or carrier, obviously no carrier software of any kind whatsoever. And it's running the latest, well, not quite the latest. It's not the latest. Android, but it's 4.4 point something, so it's, it's pretty good. Um, let me walk you through a little bit so you can have an idea what's in the package. And so you can understand this is actually really worthwhile in terms of being a flagship device. Uh, first, you've got the display. It's a gorgeous display. It's only 720p, 4.6 inches, but it's got uh, Sony's triluminous technology, I believe it's called. And what it is is... Uh, it enhances, you know, the, the brightness, the colors. The blacks are really black, which is really beautiful because this is not an OLED panel. It's an IPS panel. You can see here uh, the, 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 the colors are, you know, it's kind of just floating on top of the display. Um, very, very nicely made. Um, you've got the usual sensors and, 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 and speakers and stuff. You've got a speaker right on top of the Sony logo here. Two megapixel front-facing camera. You've got another speaker at the bottom. Um, and uh, if you flip it over, you get the pièce de résistance. Just like the Z3 non-compact, this phone has a 20 megapixel camera, yes, 20. By default, it shoots at eight megapixels, and I actually recommend you leave it in that mode because it adds a whole bunch of functionality like uh, image stabilization, uh, auto HDR, and a bunch of other really helpful things. So the camera, you know, looks great on paper, um, but it's, I would say, one of the better ones, but not nearly as great as Sony would like you to believe. Um, it also shoots 4K, which is pretty awesome. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of specs, internally you've got a Snapdragon 801, 2 gigs of RAM, and only 16 gigabytes of storage. But thankfully, there's a micro SD card slot. So you're not completely stuck with terms of storage. But that's one of the areas that I think Sony could have done a better job. You got an LED flash, obviously, NFC, all the things, you, bells and whistles you'd expect. What is cool is that if you do a tour of the sides here, on the right-hand side, there's a power key volume rocker, but there's also a dual detent camera button. So, you know, you can take a, a photo by just half clicking and then for focus and fully clicking. I think every Android phone should come with this. Very few do, but if you're into photography, this is a really major thing to have. Uh, on the bottom, you get a microphone and a nice little spot to put a lanyard. I wish more phones went back to doing this. A lot of phones used to have a lanyard hole. And it's nice, you don't drop your phone if you have it, especially when you're taking photos, uh, like, you know, you're on, you're on a boat or something, put the strap around you, nothing bad happens. On top, you get obviously the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, a secondary microphone for noise reduction, and you know that's it essentially. On the left hand side are a bunch of ports, and so this is interesting. This phone is water resistant. You can immerse it in a sink or like a, um, do the dishes with it, drop it in the sink when you do the dishes. Nothing bad is going to happen as long as these flaps are closed. There's two flaps on the left hand side, one on top, which has um, the micro USB and the SD card slot, micro SD. And then on the bottom, there's one that's actually interestingly not labeled. But underneath it uh, is where you'll find the nano SIM for this phone. So it's a nano SIM. I think more and more devices seem to be headed in that direction. So you probably have to get used to it. And of course, closing these, uh, these little flaps is important because that's what the water resistance is all about. So just be careful that you close it properly. There's also a custom connector that's magnetic. It's for a dock that Sony makes. I've never seen it in person. And you know I've seen a lot of Sony products. So don't count on this being quite useful. But in terms of this, uh, Overall, this phone, you know, if you're looking for a high-end phone, but you have small hands or you don't want to go for something that's going to take up a lot of real estate, this is, this is the phone, you know. Um, it's 4.6 inch, 720p display. It could be 1080p, I guess, but at 4.6 inches, uh, it's really not a big deal. And most importantly, uh, it saves battery to have less pixels to, uh, to, uh, to drive. Um, speaking of battery, this is a 2,500 or so milliamp hour battery. Battery life is great. Snapdragon 801 is very efficient. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. I like high-end phones, as you know. And again, the camera really, you know, is, is being pushed really hard by Sony. But um, honestly, I think if this had OIS, optical image stabilization, which is really a technology that's becoming more and more popular on high-end phones, this might actually be my daily driver. This would probably be the phone I use every day. For me, as a photography buff, the OIS is really what's missing from this device. But other than that, everything about it is delightful. So pros, as I said, uh, top specs, small, water resistant are probably the big three. Um, and it's, I think, a really beautiful design. The fact that you get a very plain version of Android to work with, no, no, uh, no glut here. And uh, cons, you know, probably the camera. Not that it's a bad camera, don't get me wrong. It'll definitely get the job done. But Sony has hyped the camera so much that it just doesn't live up to the, oh my god, 20 megapixel, because it lacks OIS. In closing, to me, the Sony uh, Xperia Z3 Compact is an absolute no doubt buy. It's probably one of the top five or 10 phones on the market today. Comes in funky colors, is small, compact, beautiful. Um, you know, Sony has done a really good job at not cutting any corners on this, except for perhaps OIS uh, on the camera. So there you have it, the Sony Xperia Z3 Compact here on Before You Buy. I'm Miriam Joar, and I'll catch you next time. That's Miriam Joar with a buy for the Sony Xperia Z3 Compact. So if you're taking a look at a smaller phone, who knows, maybe that's your next purchase. Now, uh, coming up next, we asked Jason Howell to take a look at the Dell Venue 8. This is a, it looks like a standard 8-inch tablet, but this thing has an absolutely gorgeous screen. The question is whether or not that's going to impress a man who takes a look at these day in and day out. So without further ado, hey, Jason, tell us all about the Venue. Hey, what's up? I'm Jason Howell, and I am here with the Dell Venue 8 7000. This is Dell's new tablet. They unveiled it at CES this year and it had a lot of buzz around it because of its thin 
uh, profile, you'll see it's very, very thin. I'll talk about that here in a second. It's uh, $399. You can pick it up at Dell.com. Uh, so let's take a look at the specs. It's an 8.4-inch OLED 2560 by 1600 resolution tablet. That's 361 pixels per inch. It's running an Intel Atom Z3580 2.3 gigahertz quad-core CPU. It's a 64-bit chip inside there. So it'll be 64-bit capable when Lollipop comes around, which Dell actually says is going to be soon. It's running KitKat right now, which is kind of unfortunate that they didn't launch with Lollipop, but that's just how it goes. Um, it has two gigs of RAM inside, 16 gigs of internal storage. It does have a micro SD card slot that's expandable to 512 gigs on the side. So you can pack a lot of storage in there if you want to. Now it has an eight megapixel rear facing camera up at the top there, but you also notice two other cameras on the side. These are both 720p cameras that are included for depth sensing. And then down at the bottom of the tablet, you can see that there is a single two megapixel front facing camera shooting forward. Those have stereo speakers as well on one side of the tablet and a 5,900 milliamp hour battery. All right, so let's take a look at the design first and foremost. It's definite key feature here is that it's thin. It's the world's thinnest tablet, as Dell says, and uh, pretty light as well. Thinness, it's right around six millimeters, and that's thinner than a pencil. Still feels pretty solid, uh, definitely a solid build. It's an anodized aluminum body. There's front-facing stereo speakers, like I said, and they're loud enough. The only problem with the stereo speakers is that they're only stereo when you're in portrait mode. You go into landscape for a movie or a gaming, and suddenly the stereo speakers are kind of pointless. It's just on one side of the, the screen. It's kind of a bummer. The buttons on the side are pretty uh, stable, have nice kind of uh, a nice feel to them, and uh, they feel super sturdy, but maybe just a little bit too flush, I'd say. But overall, they're all right. Thin bezels all around, as you can see here, but obviously the bottom bezel is the large one, and that's just because it's packing everything else. It's got the cameras built into it, the speakers, everything you need inside that single uh, portion of the tablet. And I would say the design in general has pretty sharp edges. So if you're holding on to it for a long enough period of time, it starts to kind of wear on your hands. Uh, overall, design looks nice. I don't know if it's the most functional design in the world. I did register some phantom touches on the sides because of the thin bezels at times. So uh, consider that. Uh, as for the display, I definitely say it's the key feature of this device. There isn't a whole lot to say about it other than that it's excellent, it's vibrant, uh, saturation is, is you know, a little strong, but still there's enough detail in there and things look good. So I'd say it's definitely a strong point of the tablet. Performance wise, I uh, did a you know, web browsing, which I actually put it through the Verge test, switched to desktop mode to see how well it did. And I'd say it performed pretty well, more or less on the Verge site, as well as, you know, just general web browsing. Uh, gaming, played some games. My favorite to test right now is Riptide G2. Uh, and it's, you know, it. I thought it was pretty sturdy, pretty stable on gaming, though the device did heat up a little bit over prolonged use. Battery efficient, definitely battery efficient through daily use. I was able to get through a couple of days of using this as my regular tablet, so good there. Um, I'd say overall, few minor issues with uh, performance here and there, but I was pretty happy with it. All right, now let's move on to the cameras, which I would definitely say is kind of one of Dell's key features here. It has the Intel RealSense cameras built in. That's the two cameras on the side and then the camera up at the top. This camera up at the top is the main camera and that's what you see through the camera app and that you take pictures through. These other cameras are there and you can preview them through the app while you're taking pictures, but they're pretty much just providing depth information into the photo, allowing you to kind of go back and do some, you know, rack rack blurs and that sort of stuff. Um, unfortunately, the position of the camera is down at the bottom. So if you want to take pictures, you actually do have to rotate it upside down and they advise you of doing that, which isn't a deal breaker. As you can see, the desktop actually repositions itself when it's upside down. It's just kind of awkward to do. And then, of course, you have these the power buttons and volume buttons down here that you're managing around and you press the wrong thing and suddenly, you know, the volume goes down or the screen goes off. Um, so you just gotta got to keep that in mind when you're taking pictures. Uh, definitely the depth sensing technology requires a lot of really good light and it also has a requirement of objects 
projects being three to 16 feet away. And it's kind of a sweet spot. It takes a little practice to get in there. And even when I got it, I wouldn't say that it necessarily looked amazing. I had a couple of pictures that looked okay with it. Um, and then just general gripe with cameras on tablets is that low light performance just the, the image quality in general is never 100%, a uh, little grainy and just not the best. As for the software, this is running KitKat, and it's a pretty unchanged version of KitKat. You can see just kind of bouncing through that everything looks pretty stock, pretty standard to the way Google designed KitKat. A few touches here and there, but not a whole lot. There are a few Dell apps built in, uh, some of which I've shown off already. The camera app that supports the RealSense depth cameras. There's the gallery that you can actually sync Google+, Plus, Facebook, and Dropbox inside that app, and also use some of its advanced photo editing features for you know, that Instagram effect. There's Dell Live Wallpaper, which you can kind of see on the background right now. I have a little bit of wallpaper that when I move, you get a little parallax view. Uh, it's subtle and it's neat. Um, and the Dell Live Wallpaper app allows you to select a few of those. And then uh, My Dell is a support app, which kind of gives you some diagnostic access uh, there. And then finally, the Dellcast. And this is an app that we're going to go into just really quick here. It's an $80 dongle, HDMI dongle that Dell sells as an additional accessory. And this tablet can be used as basically a desktop computer. You plug that HDMI dongle into the back of a TV, you sync it up with a wireless keyboard and mouse, and plug it all in and run the Dellcast app on here, and voila, your tablet now becomes a desktop environment on any external uh, TV that has HDMI input. Um, and I would say, in my experience, it was pretty laggy, pretty fiddly. It's all wirelessly done, so, you know, random issues arise and you get little breakups and pixelation and all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, I'm just not convinced in Android in the desktop environment. I feel like it just makes things... You know, their aim is to make things more uh, productive. I feel like it just kind of slows me down. I'm sure over time, maybe I get used to it a little bit more, but I'm not sure I'd give it that time because in my time playing with it, it just wasn't that successful uh, in convincing me that it needed to happen. All right, so the pros of the Dell Venue 8 7000. Uh, it's incredibly thin and incredibly light, so that's nice. The display definitely pops. It's got a nice visual representation on the display. Uh, desktop mode with Dellcast could be a win for some. For me, I wouldn't say that it was, but some people want desktop on Android, so there you go. And the RealSense cameras on the back are definitely different. But in the cons, I'd say RealSense still feels like a gimmick. It doesn't feel like a, a reason to purchase a device, just a, a nice added feature that maybe you're going to use a little bit more uh, than you think. Uh, picture quality, of course, it's a tablet. I don't expect a whole lot in image quality, but uh, it definitely didn't you know, stand up. And that awkward chin down at the bottom with the awkward, crazy placement of the cameras just kind of gets in the way more often than I would hope. Now, as for my verdict, I was kind of hedging between don't buy and try Try only because it's not the tablet for me, but I do know that a lot of people are looking for Android in a desktop environment. Maybe that's convenient to them. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a try. It's $400, and that's the same cost as a Nexus 9, which personally I would buy over the two. But if you want Android in a desktop environment, if you want to play around with some of the advanced photo features that RealSense cameras kind of bring to the table in here, then, you know, definitely take a look. This is the Dell Venue 8 7000 for $399. Thank you so much for watching my review. My name is Jason Howell. You can catch my other reviews on All About Android at twit.tv slash AAA. Thanks a lot. That's the Dell Venue 8 7000. That was Jason Howell, our Android expert. Don't forget you can always find him on All About Android Tuesdays at 5 o'clock and for Android App Arena 5, oh, 4.30 on Wednesdays. Now, it, he gave it a try, but if you are looking for an Android tablet in a desktop format, Maybe that's going to be for you. Uh, we want to do something a little different for this next item. Most of you who have watched any of my shows know that I'm a big fan of the Acer S7. This is my Ultrabook of choice. It's light, it's powerful, it's beautiful, and it's just incredibly well designed. I've, I've been rocking this thing for two years, but recently I called out over to the folks at Acer and asked them if, if there was something else that I should be using, something I should take a look at, and they sent me this. Now, this is just a first look. I, I really want to give you an in-depth look of what this is. This is the R13.
This is essentially an upgrade of the R7 that we took a look at uh, what it must have been like 14 months ago. It's a new generation of notebooks, a convertible. Uh, if you were at CES this year, going back uh, to, back out to the wide, you, you know that this is what happened to tablets. Tablets all but disappeared from CES, and that was because manufacturers are going back to convertible slash hybrid notebooks. That's exactly what this is. It's an easel design. So this screen doesn't completely detach from the notebook, but what it does do is it allows you to hinge it so that I could put this in a couple of different conf configurations. I could do, use it like this if I want to sort of have an easel or, or even make it float above the keyboard. I could flip it around and uh, it will auto rotate so that I could use it as a presentation space or I could just fold it back on itself to use it as a tablet. Now the nice thing about designs like this is that it's no longer a compromise. In the past, it felt as if you were losing a little something something with your notebook by having a, a, a hinge like this. But this is a full-featured Windows 8 notebook. It's got an Intel 5410U, so it's, an, it's a very snappy processor, eight gigabytes of memory, it's got a 2K screen that will do 2560 by 1440 resolution, and it's also got a feature that I really like, and that is it keeps the RAID 0 SSD that I found so very useful with the, uh, the S7. Essentially, it's two SSDs that they've put together on a board running in performance RAID, RAID 0, which just gives you a ridiculous amount of performance out of a 512 gigabyte SSD. Uh, one of the other things that they changed between this and the uh, R7 is this keyboard is solid. I think that was my biggest complaint about the old one, which was it felt a little mushy. If you didn't hit a key directly, it wasn't gonna really go over, but this one is sharp, it's responsive, and combined with the multi-touch touchscreen, uh, I, you know, I think this might actually replace my S7. I, I'm going to spend, I think, the next three weeks or so just putting this through its paces. I'm going to let this become my daily driver here at Twit. I'm going to see if it can do everything I needed out of my S7, plus all the features they promised out of an easel PC, which includes hanging this over to our crack artist, Greg Burnett, who's uh, going to see if maybe the, the stylus pen that comes with it is, uh, is the thing for artists. Now, take a look at this. This is the Acer R13. I'm going to give you an honest to goodness look, a long-term review of uh, whether or not this is going to become the new uh, laptop for Padre. Now, when we come back, we need to take a look at something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is stuff in the makerspace. Specifically, we've got Aaron Newcomb and the Raspberry Pi 2. That's right, the brand new version. He's going to let you know if it's something that you should buy if you want to get into making, programming, and doing yourself. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of Before You Buy, and it's Prosper. Now, if you've watched Twit, you probably know a little bit about Prosper. Prosper is a lending marketplace. It's not a traditional place to go when you, you need resources. Prosper is all about going from people who have money to lend to people who need money to be lent to them. I'll face it, there aren't that many good ways to borrow money when you need it. You could call friends, you could call family, you could put it on your credit card, but those just aren't really good, especially traditional bank loans, which have all sorts of stipulations and take a long, long time. If you need money quickly for your next project, for your next investment, for your next thing, Prosper is the place to go. Now, you can borrow up to $35,000 in as few as five days, and you can use the money for just about anything you desire to pay off those high-rate credit cards, to fix up the house, and maybe even put it into your business. I, I remember before I entered the priesthood, before I was working at Twit, I actually ran my own business, and at one point, uh, my, my contracts were such that I had outstretched my cash resources. I wish Prosper had existed back then because I was forced into the bank shuffle, going from bank manager to bank manager, trying to show them that I was cash positive. I just needed a bridge loan so that I could collect my next month's pay. Well, I wouldn't have to do that with Prosper. I could go to the people who have that money, who understand what I'm trying to do, and get the cash that I need to keep doing business. Really, that's what Prosper is all about. Don't rack up more debt on your credit cards. You can pay them off with Prosper. Prosper's online marketplace does connect those people who have money to lend to those people who need it. And what better way can we have it in the generation of the internet? To check your low rate instantly right now without, a checking, without affecting your good credit, Go to prosper.com slash twit and see if maybe their one-click custom rate is for you. Now and for a limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers a $50 Visa gift card with your low-interest loan. 
You can get up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card by going to prosper.com slash twit. That's right, prosper.com slash twit for this special offer just for twit viewers. Do it now, prosper.com slash twit. And we thank Prosper for their support of Before You Buy. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the new Raspberry Pi 2 has in stores for makers. Hi everybody, Aaron Newcomb here for another review. Uh, this time it's more technology. Uh, I love being on BYB, BYB and uh, reviewing all these uh, really cool gadgets. Um, this case, I'm super excited about this, as you can tell. Uh, this is the Raspberry Pi version 2. You know, I was on a while ago, I reviewed the Raspberry Pi Model A when it came out. And uh, at that time, you know, uh, Eben Upton from the Raspberry Pi Foundation said they weren't going to come out with a new version of the Raspberry Pi uh, B, the, the, the one that usually people use for projects and things until like 2017. Hello. But here it is about six months later, and they have indeed come out with the Model 2. This is a great little device. You can buy it online just about everywhere, Amazon, or uh, you can buy it directly from a lot of uh, the partners that Raspberry Pi uses to distribute these things. So let me just go over what's different about the Raspberry Pi 2 B Plus has a really long name. Uh, what they did in this model is they put in a new Broadcom chip. Um, and what that means is that number one, it's not running at 700 megahertz anymore, it's running at 900 megahertz. And they've given you four cores. So the previous model was 700 megahertz single core. This is 900 megahertz quad core processor. That means that there's so much more processing power available for you to use. Not only that, they've added some additional memory. So now there's one gig of memory on this device which is fantastic. Almost nothing else changes. The device is basically the same. It's really easy to identify these, by the way, because you can see the memory chip right here on the back. If you're ever wondering if it's a, uh, a Model 1 or a Model 2, version 1, version 2, you can always tell by just looking at the back and seeing that little chip there. Uh, not to mention that it does say right on the front that it's a Model 2. But um, uh, so you have the extra CPU, the extra processing power, um, everything else is the same, though. The form factor is the same. Um, you still got the same number of USB ports, Ethernet ports, um, audio, video, power. Everything else is the same, but it's just much, much more powerful. What this means in, in real life is that you're going to see a huge jump in boot time, loading of programs. You're going to be able to run things that you weren't able to run before. I'm really excited about this because... I can now run uh, my em all my emulators, my video game emulators, basically at full speed um, and not even really tap into the power of this chip. It's really, really fantastic. And um, I think you're really, really going to love it. Not only that, the only thing that really changes programmatically on this board is there's a new kernel to support the, the new CPU. Other than that, everything should run just as it did before um, on the uh, original Model B. So you won't have to worry about changing any of your programs. All the tutorials out there that you have um, that you go to to run your projects on these boards won't change. You can go do that. You just have to make sure that you load the version for uh, Model 2, which has the updated kernel. And that's it. That's it. Everything should run. So this is a fantastic board. I'm really excited about it. In my tests, I've been able to see huge jumps in performance. Boot time, this boot, this thing boots up way faster than my Windows machine does, and it boots up about as fast as my Linux machines do. So boot time is tremendously improved. Um, I think what you'll see in the future is you'll see people uh, modifying their programs to run with the multi-core chip. So for right now, things will run faster just because you're running on a faster CPU, even on a single core. But as people start to recompile their programs to take advantage of the multi-core system, you're really going to see the performance jump. So um, I think you're really going to love this. The kicker of this is, though, um, and I mentioned this before, is that it's $35 still. Um, it's always been $35. It's still $35. But you're getting an incredible bump in performance with this particular uh, this particular platform, this upgrade that they've done, you're getting a really good performance boost and the price is exactly the same. So if you've been holding off and you've been wondering, well, should I get one? Should I, you know, could I ask actually use it as my as my desktop PC or maybe as a desktop PC for, for a kid? You absolutely can do this now. So it's really, really wonderful. Um, the pros on this thing, first of all, everything's compatible. There's no difference in 
um, uh, programmatically, except you just have to load the new kernel re uh, version when you load your image. You'll see that there's a Model 2 version and the kernel is really the only thing that's changed. Um, uh, secondly, the form factor is the same. Everything stays the same. You're getting a ton of performance improvements, one core to four core, and 512 megabytes to one gigabyte of memory. Those are the real advantages. In terms of cons, there's no cons to this. Go out and buy it. Enjoy it. Um, and, um, you know, start hacking on something. Start creating a project. If you were waiting till the performance got better, your wait is over. Go out and buy one of these things today. $35. I really think you're going to love it. So once again, this is the Raspberry Pi Model 2 B+. Plus. This is Aaron Newcomb. Thanks for watching. That's Aaron Newcomb, and he gives a buy to the Raspberry Pi 2. If you're a maker, that's really a no-brainer. Go pick yourself up one right now and start experimenting. Now, uh, you can also, also find Aaron here on the Twit TV network. He does floss uh, many days. He also does all about Android. So uh, just watch Twit TV, and eventually you'll see Aaron pop up. And don't forget, he is very heavily involved in the Benicia Mini Maker Fair. So if you, uh, if you feel the maker spirit and you're in the Bay Area, why not come out? Uh, we've got a little something special starting with this new era of Before You Buy. We always get products in the back room that uh, look interesting sometimes, but don't really merit a full review. We're going to call it our parting shot. And here with our very first parting shot is our very own Megan Maroney. <laughs> You've got this Buy Robots Drony thingy? Yeah, <laughs> drony thingy. Uh, we didn't intend it to be a parting shot, although from the beginning, when I got this, you said it's not so good. Well, I mean, I said it wasn't for me. Yes. And yeah, it's it's a mini drone. It can be flown indoors. It's it's really designed for kids. It's it's got a, a couple of interesting features, like the ability to play fighters. Right. You can right. shoot each other down. Right. But you pointed out that the way it trains people, it trains kids, is not great because all of the quadcopters don't work like this. Yeah. And so it, tra it can train a child to to use it wrong, and then they get another one, and it's just not so great. So I went into that, but then it was it was fine for my kids for a while, and then. This and, happened. Uh, I, 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 wait, wait. Uh -oh. it's, actually, this is one of the problems. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, not flying straight is not a great is not a great yes. thing to have in your product. Right, and we did all the things like we checked the motor for hairs. You know, that's what happens a lot with these. You know, they get hairs in the motors. But oh, poor should little we try drone. it again? Yeah, let's let's, let's see what's going to go this time. All right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the buy robots. Uh. And, and we should say how much it costs, right? Too, because I mean, it's not cheap. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I've seen products like this, and you can forgive them because they cost twenty, thirty dollars. Right. It's like, okay, oh, well, thank you. You, you break it, but this is a little pricey. Yeah, yeah it was like a hundred dollars. Oh, okay, that's yeah. a problem. Right. Now, now, a as a mother, I know you're always very interested in, in having products that are safe for your kids. That can also teach them things. Right. Does this fit in that category at all? Um, not really. It wasn't dangerous. Okay. Um, you know, and we didn't put the guides on it because it didn't really fly very well with the guides. So it never hurt anyone. Um, and, and uh, you know, as you can see, I'm not very good at even yeah. flying the, the ones that are easy to fly. <laughs> oh, <I got laughs> oh, you're good. Whoa, hey. Drone reflexes. catching. Uh, so, uh, so, so, no, I, I... I've also noticed this. Every time you have an impact, this battery tends to get knocked out. Yes, yeah. Which is awesome because it means that if you hit a wall you have to go over and pick the thing back up but yeah that, that not flying straight thing that sounds like a, a deal breaker yeah it, it really is especially for kids who are young I mean my boys are nine and they get really frustrated and it's no fun when you spend a hundred dollars on something and it makes them really frustrated yeah so yeah. yeah I mean we've had other ones we have the bee copter you know the quad copter that has right. little bee and it's about forty dollars it's great see that's I think that's what kills it it's not that this is a bad thing it's just that for that expense, for that price, you could get something else that's much, much better. Right. And yeah, that, that kind of kills it. So I, I'm not sh sure if I even have to ask you for this uh, out of a parting shot, but it's probably not a buy and it's no. probably not a try. Sad. No, probably not. <sighs> well, I would sorry. say no. I mean, I, I like to be nice to everything and, I, you know, you tried, but I would say no. Now, if it, we, we are going to have another segment on Before You Buy. We're going to call it Redemption, where we're going to allow oh. manufacturers to come in and maybe they sent us a faulty product or right. maybe they've improved it. Right. If if you were going to take another look at this, what would be the thing that you tell Buy Robot that they need to fix before we take another look? Well, I would say for it not to break. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> for the we'll battery to fit we'll start in. With that. For the battery to fit in better, um, maybe a little cheaper if they could. I mean, we should say you know it's designed for fighting too, so it's not you know the with the lasers and everything. So I mean, that, those are all great features. It had a camera. Those are great features to keep. But I would say uh, 
a little sturdier. Yeah, that's okay. Megan Maroney. This is the by robots uh, drone fighter, and this has been Ooh. before you return. <laughs> And there goes the battery. <laughs> now, now, you you are also all over the Twit TV network. This last week, you were really busy because Mike was in Barcelona, so yes. you had to cover 10 shows over the I week. Did. But usually, you are our star for Tech News Tonight, which they can find every evening at 4 o'clock. Right. right, yeah, it's coming up in 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. If you guys finish on time. And, uh, you know, for those people who maybe haven't caught Tech News Tonight, maybe they're living in a cave or under a rock, what do you say is the thing that should attract them? What does Tech News Tonight give them? Well, just the short bit of the news that you need to hear about in 10 or 15 minutes. There you go. Sometimes 20, depending on how much I have to say. Megan Maroney, catch her every day, 4 o'clock here at live.twit. TV. And i5 for the iPhone. And i5 for the iPhone. On That's Wednesdays. Right. On Wednesdays. Now, I want to thank everyone who joined in, and especially all of our hosts who gave us reviews, especially to Leo Laporte. Stay in that tub. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even watch. It's a new generation of Leo, and I think, I think we just got the first taste of it. Right. Uh, to Jason Howell with the Dell Venue 8, to Miriam Jouar for the Sony Xperia phone, to Aaron Newcomb for the Raspberry Pi 2, to you for our Before You Return product. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Don't forget, Before You Buy has moved to Fridays. That's right. Every Friday, supposedly at 2 o'clock, you can find us looking at all the latest and the greatest in the consumer world. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas there. This has been Before You Buy. And uh, remember, you got to watch Before You Buy. <laughs>